я подключу обратно сейчас. Чтобы побыстрее. Флешки будете? Да, а, ваша вон, по-моему, без эмоций. Да. Можно я поставлю обратно? Раз-два, раз-два. Dear colleagues, welcome to our conference. I'm so happy to see you today because it's so snow, it's uh, <laughs> very difficult to come here. Thank you for your coming. Um, let's start our conference. I'd like to present you our team. Uh, at first, I'd like to present you our professor from the Department of Foreign Languages, uh, Professor Abagrova um, Nelly Gennadzina. Our dear friend, uh, director of uh, the company Stomus, uh, Chernovol, uh, Elizaveta Mikhailovna. Um, assistant of the Department of uh, uh, Therapy Stomatologist, uh, Archilovna Nino Yamanidze. And um, assistant of Department Maxillofacial Surgeon, Zernitska Ksenia. I, I, oh, I, sorry, <laughs> Ekaterina. And um, okay, let's start. At first, uh, 
our conference uh, starts uh, Kasimova Nadira, 3D model of um, artificial teeth uh, sitting according to Vasilyev's method in educational process. Please. Dear judges, colleagues, my work is devoted to a problem of improvement of understanding the questions of uh, technological discipline, particularly the questions of artificial teeth arrangement according to the one of the known technique remain hidden to understanding of the students. Therefore, when studying the sections of um, artificial teeth arrangement in the complex tooth uh, replacement of the module of the prosthetic dentistry, it's advisable to use additional virtual way explanations. Uh, so consequently, the idea of a 3D model creation of this technological process appeared. The aim of the work is uh, the analysis of uh, basic principles of classical arrangement of the artificial teeth according to Vasilis' method with the doubling of this manipulation to a 3D model of Edentilius maxillary mandible with the subsequent usage and determination of its efficiency in the educational process. For achievement of this aim, it was, advised, uh, it was necessary to examine specific literature that helped us to highlight and systematize basic requirements that were used in the creation of a 3D model. So now uh, let me show you a 3D model of this artificial teeth arrangement that was created by the um, SOLIDWORKS program. So now let me show you. Um, the arrangement of the maxillary cent uh, central incisor starts with the uh, replacement of uh, these uh, teeth. So the maxillary central incisor should be at the both side, from the both side of the facial midline and the cutting edge of the teeth should touch the glass. And the lateral incisor should be at the distance of uh, half millimeter from the glass and the neck of the, the necks of the central incisor should be at the lip line level and the um, uh, neck of the lateral incisor should be below and the canning slightly above of it. The canning cusp should um, uh, touch the glass and then the first premolar. So the buccal cusp of the first premolar should touch the glass and the, uh, the second premolar touch the, touch the glass with the, both of its cusps. Then we put the first premolar and uh, it touched the glass with the mesial buccal cusp and the second molar uh, doesn't touch the glass and it's on the distance of within two, two and a half millimeters. So, uh, thanks to this cusp arrangement, there are um, transversal and um, sagittal uh, occlusive curves that uh, helps to preservation of the multiply context within, during the chewing of the lower jaw that keeps the stabilization of the denture. So, um, after the arrangement of the maxillary teeth, we start the, so the arch gets the semi-ellipsis form that also keeps the stabilization of the denture. The, then we start the uh, placement of the lower teeth. So we started with the second premolar because it's convenient to determine uh, its amplitude within two, three millimeters on their occlusive uh, surface in the articulator. Then we put the first molar and the second one, as you see. And then we put the first premolar. So we start with the lateral group of the teeth uh, because they uh, create the fissure tubercular contacts. After that we put the frontal group of the teeth and we start with the central incisor and the lateral incisors. We put them in parallel so the cutting edge of the central incisor should be slightly below than the lateral one about the cusp. It's uh, interesting because uh, we put them and the uh, canning, the canning's cusp should be a little tilt to the midline uh, because the uh, medial part of the buccal surface will be, will be the continuation of the uh, frontal of the oval that is uh, the formed with the frontal uh, frontal groups and the uh, distal part of these teeth will be the beginning of the so here you see the uh, fissure tubercular context and the beginning of the uh, lateral group. 
So uh, at the end, I'd like to say that uh, as a re the result, we created the 3D model of uh, this technological process. And in conclusion, I'd like to say that the usage of the 3D models in the educational process significantly extends the range of interactive forms of education and um, keeps the non-standard uh, non innovative approach to studying of um, complex tooth replacement module in prosthetic dentistry and also helps the students uh, with the uh, independent remote training. So uh, memorization of the topic information by the students of the fifth year and the residents where these uh, 3D models were approved by the control of my scientific advisor was uh, higher compared to the students where these um, traditional liner picture were used. So um, it gives the reason to speak about the improvement of the main information and perception of the main information by the students. So this could be the basis of future clinical thinking. Thank you for your attention. So I'm ready for answering for your questions. So actually, when we um, start this work, uh, it took like two years because uh, we firstly uh, should uh, just uh, check the knowledge of the students, and then we started uh, to choose which topics are the most difficult for understanding and the perception of the information. And actually, this is for the fifth uh, year of the students, this artificial teeth arrangement and the, um, the um, connection between teeth and between the jaw bones. Um, it was the main topic that students didn't understand. So we decided to uh, use the additional way of explanation and yeah. I yes. Of course. So, is this model uh, dedicated only to optometric bike or also to uh, some different medications? Oh, now uh, for the first type of the bite, because uh, here we were um, thinking about the. Um, the educational way to understanding of the students. I mean, uh, the first uh, type of the bite is uh, the most useful and uh, is the most, I think, widespread. So, and we, uh, when we, yeah, just to show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes. Because uh, students should know the, about the ideal, I think, and then they start to think about the malocclusions. Yes, maybe next time. <laughs> of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nadira. The next speaker, Alayon Nadella. Dear Chairman, dear colleagues, today I would like to discuss the role of supra and subgingival irrigation in the attainment of optimal uh, oral health. Interdental cleansing is necessary for the attainment of optimal oral health. Since most toothbrushes have limited access to the uh, proximal surfaces of the tooth, measures uh, for interdental cleansing must be included in dental hygiene care plans. Interdental spaces are areas where bacteria uh, can accumulate, multiply and remain undisturbed. Undisturbed plug uh, biofilm can cause gingival inflammation and bleeding and increase the risk of periodontal diseases. This performance will address why the water flosser, also known as an oral irrigator 
or dental water jet is viable and useful adjunct for interdental cleansing. Researchers have shown the effectiveness of water flosser when comparing to tooth brushing alone to string uh, dental floss in conjunction with tooth brushing. The water flosser's mechanism of action benefits suitability uh, for specific target groups and the general public so also will be discussed. So uh, let's start with the researchers. For almost five decades, oral irrigation and its effects on interdental cleansing, tissue health and the potential of bacteria mia, as well as in reducing calculus, plaque, gingival inflammation and bleeding have been studied assiduously. The following three studies compared the water flosser to string floss when each was used as an adjunct to tooth brushing and alone. Um, the first study um, refers to um, American Dental Association and the followings also refer to American Dental Association and the first is um, Barnes uh, that found that the combined use of a water flosser with tooth brushing uh, was effective in removing plaque and uh, significantly better at reducing uh, gingivitis and bleeding uh, when compared to flossing and toothbrushing. The second, with uh, orthodontic patients, Sharma found that uh, when comparing the use of manual toothbrushing and a dental water jet using an orthodontic tip to manual toothbrushing with flossing or floss threaders or just brushing alone, the water flosser was more effective in reducing plaque and bleeding courses. Uh, Resima compared uh, three study groups, two of which were um, using a manual toothbrush plus uh, a water flosser with two different tips and a third group, a third group that used flossing with manual toothbrushing. Both water flosser groups uh, experienced a significantly better, um, greater reduction in um, gingival bleeding scores when compared to the flossing group. Um, although two dated reports, one um, involving a case study and another that compared toothbrushing to a water flosser uh, alone, questioned the plaque removal capabilities of uh, water flossing. Subsequent um, studies refute those results. In recent studies where the water flosser was used alone or as an adjunct uh, to toothbrushing, superior or equivalent reduction in plug accumulations were found. Another body of research examines the effects of oral irrigation on plug disruption, bacterial uh, virulence and host response indicators. Research suggests that water flossing may decrease the toxic products generated by plug biofilm and that a change in the host response may be made by the actual mechanism of the water flosser. So right now, let's talk about the mechanism of action. So the two main uh, physical features of water flossing action includes pulsation and pressure. Pulsation essentially uh, regulates pressure. A combination of these two actions allows to, uh, for disruption of bacterial activity, the expulsion of subgingival bacteria and the removal of loosely lodged debris and food particles. Research has determined um, the appropriate levels of pressure that should be applied during the procedure and they start from 50 to 90 pounds of pressure per square. So, according to benefits, uh, in addition to subgingival lavage with water, the water flosser can also hold, deliver and direct antimicrobial solutions into the sulcus and interproximal regions. Thus, when patients are advised to use 
antimicrobial agents for home care, the water flosser may be the best solution. Uh, six different water flossing tips can attach to the unit. And these inserts are specially designed uh, to address patients' needs, uh, to general and tongue cleansing, to orthodontic appliances, uh, to fixed restorative appliances, uh, deeper periodontal pocket areas, and tooth brushing. The water flosser could be also used um, as an effective approach for cleaning between the implants. And the conclusion. To conclude, uh, the water flosser is adaptable, easy to use, and suitable for diverse populations. Research studies demonstrated the effectiveness, patient's acceptance, and provide a validation, uh, place it among the evidence-based choices for the effective attainment of optimal oral health. And to end up with, I would really like to thank my dearest master, um, the um, assistant of the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, Dr. Molotov. And thank you for your time. If you have any questions, please don't resist. All right. So uh, the recent studies have uh, compared uh, two of these structures, an air floors and um, water floors. Both of, the, of them showed a great result in reducing um, bleeding on probing and also reducing gingivitis. But uh, water floors, a group, um, showed that showed a better, you know, um, a significantly higher. Um, results in, re in uh, um, plaque reduction. So, thank you. Well, uh, there are a lot of uh, irrigating solutions and um, it really depends on the patient which one we should use, but the most common are three. It's uh, chlorhexidine, fluorides, and peroxides. Yes, please. Um, the first irrigator was invented in 19... 62, if I'm not mistaken, in Colorado um, by a dentist and an engineer. Um, the dentist's name was Gerald and uh, Gerald uh, Moyer, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, the engineer, engineer's name was um, John Mattingly, who then invented uh, the company which is now called Waterpick. I think everyone knows about that. Yes, please? Yes, sure. Um, really, um, I couldn't find the time to do something by myself because it's the second course of the Department of the Stomatology and um, it's the least that I can do right now to entertain you. Yes, yes. It's American Association of Hygienists. Yes, please. Sorry? Well, I think that's that really depends on uh, the exact stomatologist, um, on their um, education, and it's a result of the education the, stomato the stomatologist gets. So um, it, it really depends on the doctor, I think. Yes, please?
No, of course not. I think that uh, interdental cleansing is probably like a home use, you know, a home use kit, you can see. Uh, and uh, the oral um, hygiene, the classic oral hygiene should be applied in, um, in dentistry also. So, that, yes, sure. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear. For once? Well, I think that depends on the irrigator and the instructions. So I, it's not in my competence to answer that question. Uh, I think that uh, should be like a daily mission, yes. Uh, for patients like with um, gingivitis, with bleeding, you know, with orthodontic appliances also. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, well, um, you can mm, change them actually, if you like. So. Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I think so. <laughs> Why? <laughs> the gums, you mean? So I think I didn't really understand your question and I thought that you were asking about um, the usage at all, like for all the people. I didn't hear, really. So I will probably say yes to, to your opinion. Yes. Yes. Yeah, sure. That's why there are um, there is a certain pressure from 50 to 90 um, pounds um, of pressure per square. That's it. It was very interesting. I think you should uh, you can discuss after our conference. Um, the next uh, speaker, Grachov Dmitri. Good afternoon, jury, colleagues. Today, I would like to emphasize the topic that is called integration of the intraoperative facial nerve monitoring into the complex treatment of protocol of patients with major salivary gland tumors. <clears throat> salivary gland tumors, unfortunately, don't lose their relevance. According to statistics of Russian, uh, Russian Cancer Research Center, uh, salivary gland tumors uh, account for 5% from all human organism tumors and account for 3% from head and neck region tumors. <clears throat> uh, due to striking range of morphological diversity between different types of tumors, uh, due to the number of specific complications, uh, treatment uh, outcomes usually rise. Here uh, on the slide you can see the tumor uh, on, of neoplasma of the right parotid gland. <clears throat> the important role, role uh, feature concerns uh, the peripheral part of the facial nerve. Uh, uh, due to the anatomical structure, it comes out from the still amastate foramen and um, enters the parotid gland, where it divides uh, between, just between two lobes, between superficial and deep lobe, into five branches. Here you can see this temporal, zygomatic, buccal, marginal, and coli. 
facial nerve palsy is the major complication, which is describing the condition when there is a damage to the seventh cranial nerve. Uh, frequently, uh, <coughs> the, the facial nerve lies intimately close to the tumor capsule uh, that can cause uh, nerve impairment and during surgical manipulations. It is resulting in the paralysis of mimic muscles. Such lesion require long time recovery and uh, can cause emotional, uh, static and uh, physical disorders of the patient. Here you can see on the slide the frequency of mimic disorders um, according to different authors uh, from all over the world. So, therefore, in order to provide preservation of the facial nerve structures, there is existing a system of intraoperative neuromonitoring. The system allows uh, to search and verify nerve structures to, uh, to assess the seven facial nerve to re reduce complications that usually appears and to reduce the terms of the operation and uh, rehabilitation time. Um, also, it helps uh, surgeon to minimize the surgical approach. Uh, the system intraoperative neuromonitoring consists of uh, nerve integrity monitor that is shown here, a patient interface block that connect all of the stuff in one. Here it can be seen um, under the monitor. This is special block for where there are um, electrodes um, fixed. Also, there are uh, handled uh, mono and bipolar stimulation probe. <coughs> there are small video. Yeah, there are a small video uh, showing the main principle of the intraoperative neuromonitoring work. The stimulation probe touches the nerve structure. The nerve becomes excited by the strains of a current, and the subsequent contraction of the innervated facial muscle occur. Then the amplitude of the muscle responses, or M responses, uh, alternates on the monitor. That's how it works, briefly and clearly. Uh, <coughs> uh, for all patients of the maxillofacial surgery with the di diagnosis of uh, neoplasm of the um, salivary glands, uh, such methods diagnostic are mandatory. Uh, first of all, this is ultrasonography yeah, of the salivary gland. <clears throat> it provides a clear description of the salivary, of the structure of the gland tissue and surrounding tissues. Uh, these days, uh, in the uh, in the uh, research institute of children infections, there are some specialists uh, who can who are able to visualize the uh, facial nerve, and uh, this visualization uh, is repeatedly confirmed during the operations in this area by the surgeon. Here on the slide you can see um, the yellow mark that is uh, showing the small um, facial nerve. The next diagnostic method is magnetic resonance tomography that is usually enhanced um, with the contrast and uh, uh, showing the structures of the parotid region and not only it, only um, showing the structures of the maxilla facial, facial sphere. Uh, the next diagnostic method is multi-slice computer tomography that is used for excluding the bone involvement in the, the uh, tumor process. And the last one is electroneuromography that is used to determine the initial function, functional uh, of the facial nerve. The purpose of the study was to study intraoperative param parameters of the facial nerve function activity in order to predict the recovery of functions in the post-operative period. For this, for this uh, study, uh, there were 19 case histories of patients with diagnosis of neoplasm of the parotid gland uh, for the period from 2015 to 2016 years. Uh, they were analyzed, and these patients um, had a surgical treatment. There was a nucleation or subtotal resection of the parotid gland tumor under the control of intraoperative neuromonitoring uh, of the facial nerve. Uh, all researchers of electroneuromyography were um, carried out in the, in the uh, programs like Microsoft Excel. And uh, then there was evaluation of 19 intraoperative monitor 
protocols reflecting intraoperative neuromographic characters of musculus orbicularis oris and orbicularis oculi muscle. <coughs> the results. Also, there was a program called uh, MedCalc that helped, uh, that performed the rock analysis of the neurophysiological parameters of highlighted muscles. Uh, there were two parameters that were included in this uh, program. The first one is a compound muscle active potential, and the second one is mimetic recovery outcomes. A uh, few words about rock analysis in medicine. Rock analysis, uh, this, is a class, this is a method of classification of indicators that came to the medicine from technique study. It based on true and false indicators that form the one row. Uh, there are four uh, elements uh, here. You can see uh, they are called by letters. Mm. First one is true positive element, correctly classified positive examples. The next one, true, uh, true negative, correctly classified negative example. Uh, third one is false negative. This is so-called false pass. When the event of interest um, to the surgeon, but this... Um, Indicators were not included in the rock analysis. And uh, true and false positives, uh, this is a false detection when there is absence of an event and decision is made about the presence of it. So the last two elements, false negative and false positives, uh, they decrease the quality of rock analysis uh, and decrease cutoff value and its predictive ability. Uh, it's assumed that the, yeah, it's assumed that the, uh, Classifier has a certain parameter that can be uh, right. Uh, we will get, uh, we can get uh, this um, with the help of this parameter, not, not with the help, this parameter uh, varying, and we can uh, get the um, rock analysis into two different classes. The parameter is often called a threshold or cutoff value. This is a prognostic uh, borderline. Um, as has been noticed in the beginning, uh, during various parotis, parotis salivary gland tumors, uh, operations, uh, tumor operations, facial nerve become involved, uh, manipulated, and damaged. And uh, this has a specific changes on its muscle activity. Uh, with the help of, um, to a certain point, we have the borderline between normal function and the adverse one. And we try to find it, and then prognose. Uh, with the help of rock curve, this is the rock curve, uh, <clears throat> we strive for achieving this line in order to understand whether there will be facial palsy or not. Uh, and uh, the next one is the uh, rock curve for the musculus orbicularis oculi, previous was for the oris. And in our study, uh, the edge, the borderline, the cutoff value uh, was for musculus orbicularis oris and the level of four, four, 473 uh, microvolt and for the oculi uh, 216 microvolt. And conclusion, the obtained data of rock analysis reflect very good prognostic significance of the amplitudes of M responses or compound muscle, muscle activity potentials of, mus of uh, orbicularis oculi and orbicularis oris muscles. Uh, the sensitivity and specificity threshold are respectively 80% and 90% for the mus muscles orbicularis oculi and oris. Uh, the rock analysis of the electroneuromyography indicators for the development of an unfavorable prognosis showed a reliable, reliable relationship between the amplitude of M response and the postoperative paresis of mimic muscles. And clinical case, patient K, 45 year, 44 years, uh, she was entered the clinic uh, on 6 March, yeah, on 6 March, um, with complaints about painful swelling in the, uh, in the left parotid region. Uh, the first complaints appeared in the January, yeah, with them she went to the ENT doctor, who referred her to the maxillofacial surgery. Uh, here she were performed uh, in the preoperative period uh, MRT, uh, MRT mm, diagnostic method, MS multi slice computer tomography, and fine needle aspiration biopsy for uh, understanding the structure of neoplasm. There was a suspicious, uh, sus yeah, 
there was a suspicion of malignancy. Uh, he, in the clinic of maxillofacial surgery, she was uh, she under, underwent, undergo, she underwent, yeah, uh, subtotal resection of the parotid gland tumor under control of the intraoperative neuromonitoring followed by neuroplasty. Uh, neuroplasty was, uh, was um, used with the autograph from the great auricular nerve. Here there is this theme of it, and uh, you can see, but it's in Russian, it's a problem. Uh, and um, here, Returning to this slide, we can see also the protocol of intraoperative neuromonitoring. And uh, uh, here, um, the muscle, uh, the orbicularis oculi and orbicularis oris muscle showing the um, compound muscle active potentials on the low level. That can be a prognostic if we try to understand uh, whether there will be, uh, whether there will be um, palsy after the operation or not. Here, there was. Uh, um, predictive thing that they're gonna be a uh, palsy. And after all, yes, there was a um, postoperative paralysis of mimetic muscle on the left side of the face. Uh, here on the seventh day or after the operation, you can see patient. Uh, and uh, whole conclusion, intraoperative neuromonitoring allows to identify the facial nerve to monitor its activity, to analyze the functions of nerve structures, and to predict authentically possible dysfunctions in the post-operative period. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Any questions? If you have. Your question. Thank you for your question. Uh, this um, system, this interoperative monitoring, is used not only um, by identifying the facial nerve. It used uh, most of all uh, the beginning of using this uh, system was from the neurosurgical uh, manipulations, where there was um, where it used uh, by. Um, identifying spinal nerves by identifying uh, main um, cranial nerves and uh, really the thing that it is used in the, the um, maxillofacial surgery and especially here in our study that it is uh, spreading outside on the other um, spheres and uh, can for preservation nerves all nerves of the organism yeah this one Yes. Uh, this is, thank you for your question. This is an individual thing because uh, for different patients, uh, there is a different recovery potential of the nerves. It also depends on the time that um, patients have been uh, working without uh, operation before the operation on the nerve. Uh, it depends on um, place where the nerve was dissected during the operation. And uh, in common, there is uh, time for two years when you can uh, recover this nerve. After two years, this... Um, no opportunities to uh, recover it uh, become less and less, so you won't be able to recover it after this time. Thank you. No questions. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, by Kalova Polina, also Department Maxillofacial Surgeon. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, good afternoon, jury. I 
I'd like to present you the results of our research um, into the diagnosis of uh, uh, salivary glands reactive dystrophic diseases and mild lymphoma of salivary glands. Uh, I'll begin by uh, listing uh, these salivary glands diseases um, because of uh, many difficulties in diagnosis and treatment of them. Uh, today I'll tell you about Sjogren syndrome, Mikulic disease, uh, Hereford syndrome, and uh, another one uh, disease is mild lymphoma, it is tumor. Uh, the first disease uh, which is going to be discussed is uh, Sjogren syndrome. It is well known as uh, autoimmune disorder uh, that affects exocrine glands uh, uh, such as uh, lacrimal and salivary. Uh, it uh, uh, can be separated on two types when it is uh, primary, it is alone disease, and in association with uh, the other outer immune rheumatic disease, it is secondary. Um, first, uh, I'd like to stop on the diagnostic of them. Uh, they obligatory include uh, basic, basic examination methods, additional examination methods for exocrine glands, uh, and uh, his histopathologic diagnosis. Uh, and the special for every uh, reactive dystrophic disease is the peripheral blood studies. Um, th this slide shows the clinical features of Sjogren syndrome. Uh, they can be separated on symptoms associated with the epithelial glands uh, damaging and system damages. I'd like uh, to stop on them uh, later. Now I'd like to emphasize dental signs because of uh, many dentists here. Uh, they can be revealed uh, uh, on the, um, from the patients uh, who can at first come to the dentist and they can uh, complain on uh, these uh, features. Uh, they are separated on big and small. Uh, big includes uh, xerostomia uh, and salivary gland swelling. Uh, and uh, small, uh, the consequences of the big, you can see them here. Uh, uh, symptoms of Sjogren syn syndrome, which are associated with epithelial gland glands damages, includes uh, sialadenitis, which are parenchymal uh, more often when re uh, than duct forms. Uh, there is slowly increasing salivary glands swelling, dry mouth, and uh, uh, keratoconjunctivitis. Uh, and damage of the mouth mucous membrane uh, is as a consequence. And system damages, uh, they, um, they occur because of the background autoimmune uh, illness, and uh, they are more often when uh, Sjogren syndrome is, is the secondary. Uh, this slide uh, shows um, the criteria uh, for Sjogren syndrome diagnosis uh, for today they are uh, established clear, clearly and they include ocular symptoms, oral symptoms, uh, ocular objective signs, uh, histopathology and uh, salivary glands involvement. And uh, outer antibodies should be uh, revealed from the blood an analysis. Um, as for purposes of the Sjogren syndrome treatment, uh, the, uh, the achievement of the disease remission uh, make the patient's life quality better. It is very sig significant purpose. And prevention of the complication develop development, uh, which can be life threatening. Um, because of the fact that Sjogren syndrome uh, characterized by damaging not only uh, maxillofacial localization, uh, treatment has to be provided by many specialists, uh, such as rheumatologist and ophthalmologist. Um, as for maxillofacial surgeon, uh, the treatment is uh, 
can be separated on conservative and uh, surgical, uh, but they are both only symptomatically. Uh, the next um, Mikulic disease, it's a condition involving uh, persistent, uh, persistent enlargement of the lacrimal and salivary glands, uh, which are characterized by a few autoimmune re reactions, and it is known that they have a good respons responsiveness uh, to glucocorticoids. Uh, the slide of diagnosis, as you can see, is uh, the same uh, as for Sjogren's syndrome, but there is a little bit differences in uh, peripheral blood studies. It is uh, estimated that increased immunoglobulinum G4 um, quantities uh, can be revealed. Uh, clinical features include uh, swelling of all gr groups epithelial glands. Uh, in, comp uh, in comparison with uh, Sjogren's syndrome, there is no uh, development of dry keratin con conjunctivitis and parenchymal cell denitis. And uh, there are differences, as I've said, uh, in peripheral blood studies. Uh, to establish the di diagnosis of this disease, patients have to be presented with a resistant salivary gland swelling of two major salivary glands or lacrimal glands and increased levels of immunoglobulinum G4. And uh, of course, there uh, have to be no uh, Sjogren's syndrome, lymphoma or sarcoidosis, sarcoidosis uh, established pre previously. Uh, the third syndrome is Hereford syndrome. It's a manifestation of sarcoidosis. It's uh, uh, the main uh, different uh, differ, uh, differential sign from the previous two syndromes. It is known that uh, only 6% of patients uh, are presented with this syndrome. Uh, clinical features include common symptoms uh, such as fever, fatigue, and decrease in weight, and uh, lymphadeno lymphadenopathy. And uh, uh, there is uh, uh, uveitis and swelling of the eyelids. Uh, also, there is a bilateral parotid salivary gland swelling and in, uh, increased uh, xerostomia. Uh, the slide of di diagnosis is uh, similar, but uh, there is a, uh, there are increased uh, levels of uh, cal calcium in the blood, uh, and these uh, uh, signs uh, are specific for sarcoidosis. Uh, uh, I'd like to tell some words about uh, melt lymphoma. It's uh, another type of um, the diseases. It's extranodal mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue uh, marginal zone, zone lymphomas. So you can see that it is a tumor disease. I'd like to emphasize the following um, points of melt lymphoma. It is um, uh, the most frequent lymphoma subtype of the salivary glands. Uh, it's associated with the autoimmune diseases uh, because of uh, its uh, uh, because uh, there is a role of chronic antigen stimulation. It affects uh, adults uh, with a pre female predominance in the 50-60 years. Uh, also, it is uh, unilateral swelling uh, of parotid glands, uh, and uh, the, ma the majority of patients have localized disease. Uh, it has been estimated that the uh, European uh, Soci Society of Medical Oncology uh, uh, made th those po points of uh, diagnosis of uh, lymphoma. Uh, but uh, the main differential diagnosis sign uh, may be revealed uh, while immunohistochemistry. 
it's uh, the main uh, diagno di diagnos diagnostic uh, feature. Uh, I'd like, uh, in my opinion, in my opinion, it's important to show you the clinical case uh, to demonstrate how important uh, to uh, make the correct diagnosis. Uh, patient, uh, 66 years old, uh, she complained on regular pain and pain and swelling of the both uh, parotid glands, which she didn't associate it with eating. Uh, January. Uh, 2015, she noticed the swelling of two parotid glands, uh, a feeling of goosebumps, and uh, bilateral bursting in cheek areas. Uh, she was uh, treated concerning sarcoidosis, and uh, in September uh, 2015, she has hospitalized in a maxillofacial clinic uh, of our university to the following examination and treatment. Uh, as uh, you can see, uh, she has, uh, she doesn't have any, she didn't have any specific uh, features of this disease. Uh, she had uh, bilateral parotid uh, salivary gland swelling. Um, mouth opening is free. In the oral cavity is the uh, absence of teeth, uh, bone atrophy uh, of the alveolar, alveolar. Part, and the mucous membrane is anemic and mad. Uh, these are the signs of the xerostomia. Uh, normal uh, scintigraphy can show the uh, evenly distributed radioactive isotope in salivary glands. Uh, and the diagram of normal uh, scintigraphy shows uh, the normal uh, function of major salivary glands. Uh, but our patient's uh, diagram uh, shows that there, there is no normal phases of uh, radioisotope excretion. So the function uh, was damaged. Uh, here you can see the, normal, the picture of normal cialography and the patient's uh, cellography uh, compared to normal. Uh, here you can uh, obviously see uneven distribu distribution of the contrast substance in the duct system of both uh, parotid glands. In addition to this, the excretion of the contrast uh, substance is, as, is broken. Uh, the patient's uh, cell endoscopy uh, picture compared with normal um, shows the white plug inside the duct and uh, as you can see it is narrowed. Uh, there was a biopsy of the right parotid gland under the control of facial nerve um, monitoring uh, which has been said by Dmitry previously. Uh, and there are uh, additional methods of examination were made, but the main of uh, them was uh, that uh, immune high strat chemistry uh, diagnosed uh, mild lymphoma, so the patient uh, was um, uh, directed to the hematolog hematologist uh, to treat the main disease. Uh, now it is known that she is in the remission. On this uh, slide, you can see that the function of uh, facial nerve is uh, safe. And uh, uh, summarizing all the previous uh, points, I'd like to uh, make the conclusion that uh, in, in comparison with the other cellular glands diseases, uh, reactive dystrophic diseases and uh, melt lymphoma are very rare rarely revealed and the differen differential diagnosis of these diseases is quite difficult. Um, and the treatment uh, of these diseases have to be provided by many specialists, not only maxillofacial surgery, surgeon, and depends on the established uh, diagnosis. Thank you for your attention. You can ask questions if you have any.
Uh, yes, I can show you this slide, slide which demonstrated this complaints. Uh, uh, yeah, for general dentists, uh, they can be uh, presented uh, with the swelling cell salivary glands. Uh, they will complain on the dry mouth. Uh, here you can see them. Uh, and uh, for uh, general dentists, uh, can be important features such as increased caries, uh, complaints on food sticking uh, to the oral structures, uh, the saliva will be uh, frothy, uh, and uh, patient can complaints on gingivitis and the absence of sali saliva. Yes, to maxillofacial face, surgeon or to another specialist who work with, the, with those patients. Are there many maxillofacial Not many. <laughs> uh, not, not many maxillofacial sur surgeons. I know only, uh, <laughs> only other, our de department works with those patients. Yes. Thank you. Very good news. Thank you. This, thank you for your question. This syndrome uh, is not uh, the re reactive dystrophic. Uh, it is uh, um, it, it is uh, from another theme. It is another problem. It's a problem with the uh, lymphoid tissue, but uh, it is not tumor and it is not uh, reactive dystro dyst dystrophic. So I didn't uh, take it to my work. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, please, our speaker, don't forget we have a limit of time. And uh, uh, our listening and students, you can write your name. And uh, after our conference, uh, uh, I will give you a certificate for listening. Our conference will be held in Budapest, Hungary, on the 26th of The next speaker, Dmitry Anastasia. Please welcome. like to present you a th uh, theme of my report. It's uh, arthroscopy in diagnosis and treatment of uh, temporomandibular joint disorders. Uh, so, to start with, uh, what is uh, TMD or temporomandibular joint disorder? Okay, I will move a little bit closer. Um, TMD uh, is a general term uh, which is uh, used to describe uh, the manifestation of pain and uh, dysfunction of mastication in temporal mandibular joint and its associated structures. Um, TMD is uh, always accompanied uh, by uh, highly varied clinical signs and symptoms and uh, the, uh, this causes uh, difficulty in diagnosis and treatment of this. Uh, and um, traditional methods are not given enough objective information about tissues of the joint, uh, and that's why another uh, more modern methods should be found. Mm. Uh, so. Uh, TND is a widespread problem uh, which affects uh, about 90% of the population. 
but it's still a dilemma for the dentist uh, how to recognize uh, uh, this and this pathology um, and uh, there is no adequate uh, nosological and symptomatic uh, and situational modeling of TMD um, and also is a problem uh, that uh, there is no uh, sequences of appointments, uh, the start, uh, standard sequences of appointments, uh, which uh, can be used for the treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, for today, uh, most of researchers are of the opinion of uh, multifactorial etiology of uh, temporomandibular joint disorders. Uh, and according to some statistics, uh, the main causes of functional changes are the disharmony of occlusion, uh, first of all, uh, because uh, it's uh, in 90% uh, of cases it uh, presents. Uh, uh, and uh, secondly, it's also uh, appearance of pathology of uh, connective tissues, including rheumatism. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, trauma, tumors, and some other factors can be the cause of TMD. Mm -hmm. uh, so, speaking about the genesis of TMD diseases, uh, uh, it starts with the uh, overload of articular structures, uh, which cause uh, gypoxia and increase in the free radical formation, and that leads to uh, the uh, hyaluronic acid degradation and cell membranes damage and intraarticular edema. Mm, so. Generally, there is uh, many methods uh, for diagnosis TMD. Uh, they include a clinical examination, uh, such as palpation, auscultation of abnormal sounds like clicking, uh, and also includes uh, some functional examination like uh, axiography, electromyography, and other methods. Uh, but but uh, most valuable information can be obtained through the methods of uh, visualization. And um, MRI uh, is uh, used for, uh, or ma magnetic resonance imaging is used for the indirect visualization of uh, TMG structures. Uh, and uh, it is better than uh, the computerized tomography because uh, there can be obtained um, the information about soft tissues. Um, and as you can see in the picture, um, mm, there can be uh, made two images uh, when the mouth of, is uh, open it and uh, when the mouth is closed. Uh, so on the lower pictures you can see the normal situation and the, on the upper pictures uh, you can see uh, uh, anterior disc uh, displacing, displacement uh, with the reduction when the mouth is uh, closed. <coughs> Methods of uh, treatments of uh, temporomandibular joint disorders uh, can be divided into two groups. Uh, they're surgical or non-surgical. Uh, usually, um, a doctor use both the, uh, of uh, that methods. Uh, sometimes non-surgical therapy replace surgical or come after, uh, um, come before surgical. Uh, and uh, as I said before, there is uh, many consequences of uh, uh, this method uh, using uh, for treatment. <coughs> uh, so. Uh, CMG surgery includes uh, four main methods, uh, and uh, the three of them are microinvasive, and uh, the least one is the, the most aggressive. Mm -hmm. 
uh, each of uh, the methods uh, has its own indication and um, in most cases indication depends of uh, the stage of intraarticular joint um, de uh, derangement uh, and uh, these stages were de described in the Wilkes classification so you can see in the table uh, that uh, there is uh, our Wilkes stages near the procedures. Um, nevertheless, uh, all the procedures have its own flaws, which you also can see in the table. <coughs> uh, some positive effects can be obtained uh, through the tem temporal medieval joint surgery, especially with the use of microinvasive methods, it's a reduction of pain syndrome, obtaining normal range of motion, fu functional recovery, and these are the goals of the intervention, generally. Uh, and also indirect inclusion normalization, visualization of pathological changes in its severity, and restoring the congruence of anatomical structures. It's uh, more refers to open surgery, the last one. Oh. Uh, indications for the arthroscopy are uh, mm, for making a biopsy of suspected lesions, confirmation of all di diagnostic findings that could warrant surgical information, and these two are um, more uh, used uh, in it, a, a diagnosis, uh, diagnostic arthroscopy. Mm. Uh, also, it's uh, an explained persistence of t temporal medieval joint pain that is non-responsible to medical therapy and uh, the presence of internal joint derange derangement and this uh, is described by Wilkinson classification. Uh, also, I can mention some diseases uh, that are included in the in indication. It's uh, derangement associated with uh, Hypermobility and also associated with hypermobility and joint virus and trauma, degenerative diseases and synovial diseases. Um, mm, contraindication can be divided into absolute and relative um, absolute or specific inflammatory diseases and uh, malignant tumors uh, because of risk of their setting, seeding. Um, and uh, also, relative uh, contraindication are coagulopathy, leukemia, skin infections, and uh, ankylosis. Ankylosis uh, needs uh, open surgery more than microinvasive. Mm. Uh, here are uh, mm, the, li uh, the list of manipulation uh, that can be performed during arthroscopy as a microinvasive method. Uh, they can be divided into diagnostic for diagnostic arthroscopy and the therapeutic for therapeutic arthroscopy. And uh, all of them, I will mention all of them li uh, later. <coughs> uh, visualization uh, in arthroscopy can has uh, such characteristic as uh, diameter of arthroscope, the viewing an angle, um, generally, um, the angled arthroscope is uh, used for diagnostic diagnosis, and uh, uh, zero angle, uh, zero degree is used for uh, the surgical manipulations. Uh, also, uh, artistic includes light emitting diodes uh, uh, and. Uh, HD image that can be obtained, and um, also important to say about to say about uh, water supply because it helps to extend uh, the joint capsule uh, to get uh, the right field of view. <coughs> On uh, the department of uh, maxillofacial surgery uh, is uh, used that type of microscope, Hopkins TMG arthroscope. Um, <coughs> uh, here you can see all the instruments uh, that uh, include this set of artoscope uh, and uh, mm, 
um, the future is uh, in that uh, uh, it needs an additional puncture uh, for inserting uh, instrument for the treatment. Uh, <coughs> Then in the first puncture, uh, the art the scope is inserted. <coughs> uh, electrosurgery is uh, like an additional option in TMG surgery. Uh, <coughs> These instruments are, are answer, also inserted in the additional puncture, like other. Um, uh, uh, here you can see on the picture um, the main approaches uh, to the mandibular joint. There are two typ typical points along the traga orbital line. And uh, in the first point, um, which locates uh, one centimeter anterior from the tragus, uh, the arthroscope is inserted. And in the second point, um, uh, the cannula is placing its uh, the second puncture site. Um, mm, so, uh, the technique of uh, this intervention um, <coughs> uh, the excess in the joint cavity can be achieved uh, through superior joint compa compartment. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, the puncture, firstly, is made uh, in the first typical point uh, with the trocar. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, and uh, before all the manipulation, uh, surgical assistants uh, need to distract uh, the mandibular uh, downwards and a little bit forwards. Uh, uh, to help the surgeon get uh, the right access to the joint cavity and to extend the joint cavity. Um, next. Um, uh, when, uh, after the puncture by the obturator and trocar, uh, the mm, obturator is replaced by the arthroscope. Um, and uh, after that, uh, the cannula is placed in the second puncture site, and uh, then it's become possible to make a lavage of uh, the <coughs> the joint uh, because uh, the water supply uh, is getting through the cannula uh, attached to the arthroscope. <coughs> Uh, lavage of the temporal ball joint uh, is uh, performed with the ring ringer solution uh, and uh, during the operation a certain amount of fluid is continuously supplied in, in, to, into the joint cavity for releasing some engagements and for stretching the joint capsules and for washing out the cytokines and interleukins and some other mediators. Uh, here you can see uh, the sequence of uh, mm, uh, diagnosis uh, <coughs> uh, in the arthroscopy. Uh, so I think I can move to the next slide. Um, <coughs> Arthroscopy helps uh, to recognize some uh, pathological cha changes of the tissues uh, in the joint cavity. For example, uh, early stage of uh, synovitis uh, with the uh, inflammation of tissues, uh, which you can see there. And also, it helps to recognize a uh, more late stage of synovitis with uh, more uh, blood vessels, vegetation, uh, and sometimes um, with the blood in the joint cavity. Mm. Also, through the diagnos diagnostic arthroscopy can be seen adhesions on the uh, early stage and also on the late stage with more thickened fibrous bands. Um, and also can be seen the fibrosis of TNG structures uh, on the late stage of synovitis. 
and um, the perforation of the disc uh, also can be found and it requires treatment. Mm. Uh, so the next, after diagnostic arthroscopy, we, we are moving to the arthroscopic treatment. <coughs> uh, here is uh, the, this illustration uh, describe uh, the technique of uh, perforation in the uh, second axis point uh, uh, in which the instrument for the <coughs> for the surgery will be inserted. Um, mm, triangulation technique by Joseph McCain uh, is uh, used um, for the arthroscopic treatments uh, to enable the safe arthroscopic surgical access uh, because uh, the ends of the instruments are matches in the joint cavity forming an angle. Access in that uh, point uh, uh, helps in performing the biopsy by biopsy forceps uh, and also coagulation. And uh, there should be uh, mentioned a posterior discal ligament coagulation uh, because uh, its extent of then uh, the disc is uh, moving anteriorly uh, to the um, consular head. Uh, and uh, some positive effects uh, that can be obtained through this procedure are coagulation of the broad blood vessels, vegetation in the zone, and uh, uh, through this manipulation uh, can be obtained uh, further the scar tissue formation, and uh, it um, also um, has a result as a result, an indirect disc displacement posteriorly. Uh, also, in that uh, access point, additional access points can be uh, performed adhesions removal uh, with the skissors or uh, with the methods of electrosurgery. Oh, okay. Uh, also, can be performance of synovial infiltration. Uh, and botulinum toxin inje injection with axiomin uh, medicine. Mm. Uh, disc, disc fixation is like, uh, can be awarded like a level three arthroscopy because it's uh, like an invasive procedure, uh, which is um, mm, hard to perform for the, uh, And uh, the operation ends always uh, with the prosthetic synovial fluid injection. It's um, medication durolanes in the home. It's all uh, hyaluronic acid concentrate. They are all hyaluronic acid concentrate. <coughs> um, in the end of operation, it's n uh, rarely it's necessary to make a suture. Uh, the cloth of gas strips are um, applied to the skin and hospitalization lasts uh, uh, in average uh, two or three days. Mm. Complications can be hematoma, bleeding from the superficial temporary abjury, temporary prosthesis of the facial nerve, perforation of intra-articular structures and tool breakage. Um, success rate uh, was uh, described by Martin Genzo uh, and uh, he um, in his studies uh, uh, was described 87% uh, of uh, cases of stability after the um, uh, surgical intervention. And uh, finally, I want to end with a clinical case. Uh, this uh, patient, Mr. Mrs. S, uh, uh, was complaining of pain in both pericular regions, uh, with which persists when trying to open her mouth of clicking and crunching noises. Uh, and um, mm, there was performed um, arthroscopy on both sides uh, with the removes of foraging bodies. Um, and um, <coughs> articular re uh, disc fragments were removed uh, from the joint. Um, the deep bellies of lateral turbid uh, muscles were dissected and uh, the uh, operation ends with the 
three milliliters of uh, hyaluronic acid injection. Uh, so, uh, in conclusion, I want to say that uh, currently the arthroscopy is the only method of direct diagnostic imaging of TMG structures and despite its uh, invasiveness. And uh, for uh, this reason, uh, it's uh, likely to use um, uh, arthroscope uh, imaging in uh, diagnosis of TMD. Uh, so that's all. Thank you for attention. Uh, and uh, uh, not clicking with your joint instead of making conversation. So that's all. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question. How many times will can we use the arthroscopic treatment for the patient? And is it water when we should go to the open surgery? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, there is a border. Uh, as I, um, I had the slide, uh, there was um, mentioned the indication for the each surgical treatment. And uh, when it's uh, Wilkes uh, five stage, uh, when uh, the uh, bone structures are damaged, it needs uh, primary the uh, open surgery. Uh, and uh, when there is some changes in soft tissues, uh, these changes uh, can be uh, treated by the microinvasive surgery, uh, and usually, uh, if uh, after the first uh, treatment, arthroscopic treatment, uh, the second uh, can be performed in uh, two years if uh, uh, there is uh, no improvement. I think. Yes, I looked two times on the Department of Facial Surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, there can be a little scar of, uh, because sometimes uh, the diameter of the arthroscope is maybe bigger, um, but it's still a microinvasive treatment. Uh, so sometimes it uh, needs suturing of uh, the uh, puncture site, uh, the location of puncture site. Um, so uh, there can be a little scar. <coughs> The last speaker, Daniel Pazzi. Um, hello everyone, I'd like to welcome every single one of you uh, for coming here, for managing yourself to get out of your apartment in such bad weather conditions. I know it's hard, but I'm glad you're spending every single day to become even more educated in your profession. So we're going to speak about 3D printing in orthodontics. That is really amazing what science can do and how it can change the practice of uh, general dentist or orthodontist and as well. So we're going to speak about indirect bracket positioning or placement and bonding. Um, speaking about uh, research relevance, malocclusion is one of the most common dental disorders only caries is more spread among the population 
So 3D printing has demonstrated huge potential for the future of medicine in the previous years, and its development is unstoppable. Look at these examples that are shown on the slide, and you'll be amazed what can 3D printing do nowadays. Like, for example, Bones, Professor Susmita Bose of Washington State University modified a 3D printer to behind uh, chemicals to ceramic powder, creating um, intra-ceramic scaffolds that promote the growth of the real bone in any shape. That can be used in our field, in dental field, and also here it's used in general uh, medicine. Also, ear cartilage, uh, Carnals Lawrence Bonasar used 3D photos of human ears to create ear models. These molds were then filled with a gel containing bovine cartilage cells suspended in collagen, which helped the shape of the ear while cells grew their extracellular matrix. Uh, so, this is really amazing. That's speaking about 3D um, printing and so on. But let's face the bracket positioning and bonding. What's the situation nowadays? So mostly it is divided into direct bonding or indirect bonding because it depends on which school you are practicing in your dental office. Indirect bonding is divided into computerized bracket positioning like insignia and so on, and also manual bracket positioning on a dental stone model or in our case on a 3D printed one. So here are all the steps that we're gonna quickly go through, hopefully quickly. So we'll start with an excellent alginate impression part in a high quality dental stone. Here you can see on the picture then you allow models to dry completely and create a water soluble layer. That is really important because you don't want your brackets stuck then to your model. Light cure adhesive is fully worked into the bracket mesh and the brackets are placed on the model and stored in the patient model storage box. Once all brackets are in their final light cure adhesive is activated using a light source. Well, uh, some of the dentists are using chemical activated materials, but I uh, totally recommend using the light source ones. So inner tray, there are two trays that we're creating for this uh, after all bonding. So inner tray material is applied with the dispensing gun. There are uh, several types of these guns, doesn't matter really, it's about the technique. So you're starting at the distal buckle, expressing the translucent material in a single bead with the deliberate and continuous motion. That is very important, so your uh, tray would be very um, slick and continuous. Uh, apply a one millimeter thick clear thermal forming uh, and suck down material using a vacuum forming machine. This forms a hard outer tray that will fix the inner tray in their direct position. So trim excess material away from the model with the scissors and use a wheel saw to trim the hard outer tray at the gingival border of the soft inner tray. Um, that is also important so your patient wouldn't feel any uncomfortable um, during his uh, stay at your chair. Soak the model in a pan of warm water for 15 minutes. That is important so your um, layer between the brackets and the model would uh, be gone. So the clinical procedures. Um, you have to go through all the general stuff that you do throughout uh, with the direct bonding, so it requires proper cleaning of the surface of all teeth, etching, applying the adhesive, positioning the trains, and then what is really important is verified tray does not rock and is fully seated around the, all the teeth. That is uh, what a clinician do. Um, all the other steps can be done by his assistant. Light cure the bracket from the occlusal buckle aspect through the transparent tray for the appropriate time. Um, so how uh, the 3D printing is actually implemented into this uh, 
method. So 3D printing, for those of you who might not know, is uh, an additive manufacturing, a process of making three-dimensional solid objects from a digital file. You can create any file you want. Nowadays, like for example, this company Nike uh, prints out the shoes of, of your own. You can create a pair for yourself sitting at home. So in our method, we're just printing out a CAD file of a Joe Bone. Um, how you can get a three-dimensional model of your teeth. First of all, it's intraoral scanning, which is absolutely amazing, but really, really expensive. And not many clinics and even universities can allow to buy one. So then comes the dental cone beam computed tomography, which is great, and we've tried a few of those, just printing them out, so creating a model from a subesity and then positioning the brackets on that. But there are too many errors, especially on the intraoral side of the teeth and also 3D scanning. So in our method, what we're trying to do is combine the subesity to get all the uh, root part of the teeth and as well all the bones and uh, combine it with a great model that we took with impressions like the traditional way. How do we convert Subicity file to a 3D model? You should go through um, quite very simple steps if you're friendly with your computer. So it's just Subicity scanning, then creating a DICOM file. Then in this program, in Vesalius, you're generating a 3D model and you can decide which layers to be shown and selected for further printing. Our uh, point of interest is particularly the teeth and the bone structures. Then you're creating a, an STE file in Blender. Um, and that's where all the magic happens. That's a program where we combine a Subicity file and the scan metal stone model to visualize all the teeth structures with great quality combined. So, um, some Russian slide. So you're just, uh, um, fixing all the um, conflicts that might occur between your two different models in the NetFab, which is a cloud Microsoft service, and in Adobe Mesh Mixer, you're actually printing out the model. So what was the purpose of study? To study and analyze indirect bracket placement and bonding, uh, and compare its advantages and disadvantages with the traditional method. So in our research was a group of 10 class one patients. Why we took only the class one? Because we didn't want to um, make too many um, things that we need to fight with. So also we had the 3D David scanner, which is SLS1 model and a 3D printer. If you don't have one, you can actually print it out in uh, many offices around our great city. So what results we got? Precise bracket placement via the ability of the clinician to fully visualize and access the teeth to be bonded on a model. So that's a very great advantage. Patient is more comfortable due to the minimum amount of time spent with the mouth open. One job bone requires around 15 minutes of a clinical work. That is much less than you do with direct bonding. Less stress for the patient, no doubts. Clinician is ergonomically and physically more comfortable versus awkward contrasts of direct access, for example, lots of saliva and so on. And the digital 3D model is stored in dental office and, keep, and can be reprinted if necessary. So you're not locked to have a certain room for all your models for five years for every single patient. And comparing with the digital positioning of the break system, the doctor uses his own clinical skills, eliminating the need of studying complex programs and also buying them because they're quite expensive nowadays. In conclusion, braces used in dental practice are mostly common or have torque 
variation, but they have a wide range of information embedded in them and said accurately can greatly facilitate the work of the doctor and the patient's life as well. A bracket system fixed accurately requires fewer rebondings and fewer individual bands of the orthodontic wire, which is really great also on the finishing steps. Bonding all the braces in the oral cavity is simultaneous, which significantly reduces the time spent by the patient. Our method includes the advantages of indirect using a dental stone model and digital positioning, but it has disadvantages such as more clinical time spent. Well, you can reduce this factor with the help of your assistant or two or three of them. That's only your decision. Also higher cost. It's higher than a traditional method making just one dental stone model. Studying of new software. Well, the programs that I've mentioned earlier. So it does not replace the traditional method of bonding and positioning, but becomes a great alternative for several clinical situations. Thank you very much and I also would like to thank uh, Tatiana Borisna Tkachenko and Daniel Oksevich Kardakov for such a great opportunity for applying this method in real life. Thank you. Like creating only. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So, for, uh, thank you for your question. Um, for class one patients, that really doesn't matter because um, it's not a very bad situation in malocclusion. But basically, what can allow a two tray method is uh, making less errors on the especially final steps because sometimes when you're tray you're meaning you're using only the inner layer the soft one okay yeah well yeah yeah i mean it's really soft so there can be some errors during actually positioning the train on the teeth so we try to use mostly two tray uh, method, but sometimes if it's not very hard, we can just uh, leave the hard one out. Um, well, uh, you mean between direct positioning? Uh, oh no, just two indirect methods. Well, um, the trays are not very expensive themselves if we're talking about the materials that are used. I'm, I'm not very um, uh, concerned about how much time or like um, payment for the assistance and so on costs, but materials are something around like five to ten dollars per each model. So not very big thing for an orthodontic uh, treatment. Well, for the patient, yes. But, well, uh, I mean, uh, you will spend uh, a bit more time with uh, preparing the models and so on, but what we're trying to do is to actually compare the results between, it's really tricky because all the clinical um, cases are, uh, despite they're very common, but they're really different. So how we can compare what could go wrong, if it's like bonding or it's just the patient or the wires and so on. So it's really tricky, but hopefully we're gonna get the results in a few year time. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, but also have really green, so we can check. Okay. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure.
Okay, what type of breakage system we're using? Well, no, the well, you can you can actually use whatever breakage system. Well, for example, Damon system or any kind of like victory system or mini diamond and so on. That's uh, up to you. Choosing breakage system is more uh, implemented into your diagnostics and so on. It's not about the method you're bonding it. So there are no uh, disadvantages to this method uh, on choosing the bracket system you want. Right. Right. No, the the method is that you are. Uh, bonding the brackets yourself manually so it's not done uh, in a program right only the mm, models are created computerized uh, so you can choose whatever bracket system you want and if it is uh, also combined with uh, some surgical treatment like implants and so on you also can plan that and with the 3D printing of bone, you can actually make some um, <laughs> um, some cooperative work with the surgeons in your office. That would be way more useful for them to actually hold the bone they will operate with other than looking at the uh, sebacity on the computer. Thank you.
Okay. <laughs> okay, I want to thank uh, all of speakers here because it was amazing conference with very interesting presentations. And of course, I want to thank uh, our organizer for choosing this direction of conferences because it's a big practice for the young doctors and I think it's 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 very uh, big deal. So uh, I don't know. Uh, we should uh, I think uh, start with the third place. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. And. We discuss, and it was very difficult because everyone had very beautiful presentations. And but the third place is uh, Grachov Dmitri. So come here. Yes. Okay. One second. Okay. Yes. Yes, 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 just stand here for maybe four turn after all. Okay. The second place, Kasimova Nadira, come here. Okay, and are you ready for the first place? <laughs> okay, this is a Daniel Pazio. <laughs> Daniel Pazio. Okay, and where is that? I think uh, maybe we can make a photo, or you, you, yes, you have some few words. On my side, okay. I also have a few words. Dear friends, dear colleagues, for me it's a great honor to be here. I'm on such conference for the third time, and every year I am more and more impressed by the quality of your reports. I'm speaking here on behalf of uh, Stomus Company Limited. And now we are glad to see that we are not only sales company, we are now manufacturing company. Uh, this year we started the production not far from St. Petersburg. We are going to manufacture dental implants, spare parts, for prosthetics, uh, different uh, screws, pins for surgery. And I hope that maybe one day the implant that will be produced in Stomos will be manufactured according your design. So thank you very much for your researches. And we hope that we will keep in touch. Dear Nadira, dear Dmitri, we would like to invite you to Stomos. In Stomos Clinic, we have a lot of leave operations. So I will give you the certificates, and on the certificates, you will see the telephone, so you can uh, call us and check the schedule of these leave operations, and you can come for sure, free of charge, because we hope that you will come to our family. And dear Daniel, we invite you to the lecture of Professor Zucchelli that will take part in June. So it will be very nice, very fancy event. And I hope that it will be the start 
of our friendship. As I mentioned, we have a big dental lab with 3D printing, with all computer technologies. So we hope that we will work in, not only in clinical, but also in scientific field together. Thank you to all of you. You made a great job today. Good luck. Once again. Thank you very much for all students, for our speakers, for our jury. I hope we will see you next year. Um, I wish you good luck for your scientific research. And I'm so proud of you that you grow up and have new experience, uh, new uh, methods of treatment, and uh, new way how to uh, speak and introduce your own scientific research. Good luck and have a uh, good uh, days. Thank you. <laughs> That's all. Uh, make a photo together. <laughs> Let's make a photo. <laughs>